Peace of Christ be with you. There's a few things I hope you take with you when you leave Hope College. I hope that you get a world-class education and take it with you. I hope you have lifelong friendships that will be with you, well, your whole life. One of the things that I hope you get, though, isn't just friendship and it's not just an education. It's something more primal. I hope you get a sense of ambition for greatness. And what I mean by that is what I want to talk to you about tonight. One of the things that I hope you get while you're here at Hope College is maybe what Paul is talking about in Romans 12 is not conforming to this world but being made new, but being renewed by your mind. And I think part of that has to do with our ambition. We don't want the same ambition of this world. We want to be made new and renewed by our minds that is saturated in the word. And I think that when our mind is saturated in the word, we get a new kind of ambition for the world and for our life. I hope that you take a new kind of ambition with you. To help that end, I want to invite you to read with me Mark 9, 30 through 37. If you've got a Bible, pull that out. We're in the Gospel of Mark. For those of you who are peeking in and visiting, we are in chapter 9, verse 30. And Jesus says this. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying to them, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And then he sat down and called the disciples and said to them, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. It's one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of Mark. Just this little story. And every time I hear it, I have this uncontrollable desire for vanilla cookies. <laughs> I hear that story about Jesus on the way with his disciples, and I just want a vanilla cookie. And with those crumbs still in my mouth, I want to sing. A song that maybe you know, and if you know it, well, sing with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Such nice voices. Every time I enter into that story in Mark, I want a cookie, and I want to sing that song just like that, full of soul and depth and meaning. It's an interesting story we just heard. Jesus is on the way. 
We know that in the Gospel of Mark, it is divided into 16 chapters. The first eight chapters are the signs and wonders pointing to Jesus' identity. And the last eight chapters, 9 through 16, is the fulfillment of Jesus' purpose, his destiny. Jesus is on the way, literally. He's on the way to Jerusalem, which is code for the cross. He is on the way to death. He has just been announced as the Messiah. But, as we learned last week, Jesus is always shattering our expectations. Jesus is on the way with his disciples, and on the way he begins to teach them all about what being the Messiah was going to be about. He was going to be betrayed into human hands, and those human hands will kill him. But three days after being killed, he will rise again. He was trying to prepare his disciples for what was about to happen. He was trying to give them an anticipation so they wouldn't be caught off guard. Jesus is literally telling them, it's not going to happen the way you expect. I am the Messiah, it is true, but it's going to be different. Jesus always comes, and when Jesus comes, he's always shattering our perceived expectations and giving us new expectations. Jesus is teaching his disciples that he is the Messiah, but the Messiah that God has sent has a different plan for himself and for them than maybe what they expected or what they want. You see, they still had this idea that the Messiah was going to be this warrior poet. The Messiah was the long-awaited one from the line of David who would come to put the world to rights. The Messiah was the one to kick out and exterminate Rome from the Holy Land, and they, Israel could take back the promised land that was given to them. The Messiah was the one to restore the dignity, the glory, the splendor, the greatness of the people of God. And I can't help but imagine that those disciples who had been troubadours with Jesus for the last three years, witnessing his teaching, traveling, all the trials and temptations, that they were excited that the Messiah has been named and that they are on their way to Jerusalem just about ready for the inauguration of a new reign of God. I can't Im- I can't help but imagine that if I was one of those disciples, I would be excited, that I would be feeling like I was going to get on the inside of a whole new kind of political reality. Last week, we had the inauguration of President Obama. And I can't help but wonder that His aides, those people who were closest to president throughout the campaign and the last administration as he was going and preparing for this inauguration day, if they weren't quietly nursing for themselves some secret ambitions. All of their hard work had paid off and now, and now they were going to get their just rewards. They were gonna get that promotion, that place on the staff. These disciples are with Jesus. He's on the way to Jerusalem. He is the Messiah. But Jesus keeps talking strangely. He keeps talking about death and of being betrayed and of being killed and rising again. And none of this is computing. They don't understand what Jesus is saying. For how could they? How could they anticipate what was about to happen and the long consequences, not only for them, but for the whole world? Yet despite that, Jesus is talking to them, trying to get them to renew their minds so that they could have a different kind of ambition, aspiration. While they're on the way, the disciples have a conversation, really a row, a debate, an argument about who is the greatest? Who knows who spoke first? Maybe it was Thomas who was always a little unsure of himself, asking, I wonder who among us is the best and the brightest. Maybe it was Peter, always a little brash and quick to step forward, 
saying, no, I think I'm the greatest. I'm the one that Jesus is the close to. Whoever started the conversation, we don't know, but we do know that it ended up in an argument. They were arguing on the way, debating themselves, who is the greatest? Have you ever had that kind of argument and discussion? Maybe it's kind of abstract, who is the greatest basketball player of all time? Maybe it's more personal. Who's the smartest in your class? We all live in a time of meritocracy where you are judged and defined based upon your performance and the cream rises to the top. The best and the brightest move on and other people are left behind. So we're always trained from the cradle to be striving, to be a people eager for greatness. Educational systems, even this one at Hope College, trains you to nurture that kind of ambition, that kind of instinct, to always be judging and be judged based upon who is the greatest, who's the best, who's the brightest. But Jesus tells them something that shatters their expectations of greatness. Our expectations of greatness is always defined by who wins. Whether it's in the Olympics, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in a political contest, whoever wins gets the spoils. Whoever wins gets to be defined as the greatest. But the thing is, only one person can win which means that there can only be one great person. But Jesus, Jesus has a radically different notion of greatness. And it's that notion that he wants to teach his disciples. And it's that notion of greatness that he wants to teach us. And if we get that groove deep down into our soul, it will redefine everything and it will set us free. Jesus says this, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. They're arguing about who's the greatest. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? And everyone's silent. He exposes their secret and self-serving ambitions and no one speaks up. Maybe because the last time they spoke up, he rebuked Peter and called him Satan and they didn't want any of that action. <laughs> everyone's silent. They understand this is one of, another one of those teaching moments by Jesus. So he sits down, he calls the 12, and he tells them this. This is what we need to groove deep down. This is what will set us free. This is what will redefine greatness. Let's learn it together, shall we? You're smart. You're so good at this. Whoever. Whoever wants to be. Whoever wants to be first, whoever wants to be first, must be last of all, and, and servant of all. Whoever wants to be last of all, no, that's not right. I got off on my roll. Yeah, whoever wants to be first. Must be, Must be last of all, last of all. And, and servant of all. Servant of all. Don't repeat. <laughs> whoever wants to be first, whoever wants to be the greatest, whoever wants to be the best, must learn a new reflex a different kind of reflex than what you have been nurtured on ever since you ed entered the educational system ever since you have hit that playground, ever since you entered into a relationship. Whoever wants to be first, whoever wants to be great, must learn to be last of all and servant of all. It's genius. Genius. Because in the world out there, the world in which we are preparing you to enter and to fly away, in that world, only one person gets to be great. Only one person gets to wear the gold medal. And even if you miss it by one, one millionth of a second of a billionth of an anomite little thing, you get silver, 
which means that you suck, <laughs> which means that you're no good. You might have missed it by just a whisker, but you cannot call yourself the greatest. You cannot be the best. Only one person gets to be the best unless you belong to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, if you listen to Jesus' genius, you will recognize that many, in fact, all of us, get to be great. Jesus' genius, first of all, honors our desire. Do you get that? Do you notice how Jesus teaches his disciples about greatness, but he doesn't sever their desire to be great? He doesn't say, Thomas and Peter, Andrew, don't be great. I don't want you to be great. Don't nurture that ambition. He doesn't do that. He says, be great, but it's going to look like this. He says, be great, but it's going to have a, a different picture, a different outcome than maybe what you're thinking. You know, sometimes in the Christian community, I get a little worried that sometimes we think that holiness is just meant to be some, like we let people walk over us. Holiness means that we have no ambitions whatsoever. But that's just not what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Jesus is on the way. He's on the way to Jerusalem. He's on the way to the cross. He's on the way for the salvation of the world. And what drives him is an ambition. What drives him is a desire to be great. But his greatness is not defined in the same way we define greatness. I love this quote by C.S. Uh, Lewis in his wonderful sermon, The Weight of Glory. C.S. Lewis writes this, the New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We are told to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find if we do so contains an appeal to desire. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of reward as promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in his slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. It would seem, says Lewis, that our Lord would find our desires not too strong, but too weak. The problem with the Christian community is not that we have too much ambition, but we don't have enough of it, or at least not the right kind. What Lewis is suggesting to us is that God might wish us to fan into flame holy ambition, an ambition to be great. Jesus is teaching his disciples those that are going to carry on his legacy, not to hold back, not to be cowardice, but to be great, but to be the kind of greatness where others go ahead of you, where you let other people cut in line, where you readopt a mentality not to lord it over people, but to be a servant of all. That is what Christian greatness looks like. That is the ethic of the cross. That is what it means to follow Jesus along the way. Jesus wants us to be a people of strong desire, and it is a desire for greatness. That's the first part of, G of Jesus' genius in teaching. And here's the second part, is that Jesus' teaching, Jesus' genius is inclusive. Everyone can be great. In fact, God wants everyone to be great. Greatness is not reserved only for the one who crosses the line first. In 1976, in Spokane, Washington, there was a Special Olympics. Nine contestants lined up for the 100-yard dash. They all got their toes to the line 
Somebody put a gun in the air, pulled the trigger, and those nine little ones started running towards the finish line. One of them fell within a first couple steps to the asphalt, skinned his knee and cried out. The other eight continued to run, but two of those eight heard the cry and went back and picked up that little one and they started walking together, arm in arm, trotting all the way to the finish line. Everyone in the stands stood up and applauded for minutes and minutes. Who was the greatest in that race? Was it the one who crossed the line first? Maybe, got the big medal. But what everyone remembered from that event was the ones that didn't cross the line first, the ones that went back to help out someone in need, someone who was crying out in pain. The people clap because deep down we know this is true, that there's another kind of greatness than the one that comes with just striving. There's the kind of greatness that happens for looking after those that fall down and cry out in pain. Jesus is saying to us that we can all be the kinds of people who stop the race and go back and finish the race together. And in that kind of greatness, not just one person wins, but everybody wins. Do you see the genius? Do you see how Jesus is taking this normative expectation of greatness and reframing it so that it includes everyone? Jesus honors our desire to be great. And he honors it in such a way that it includes everyone. And here's my favorite bit about G T Jesus' genius, is that it invites our creativity. Because you see, there's not just one way to be great. There is a million and one in possibilities to be great. As many as the stars up in the sky, there's infinite possibility that we can imagine in our day-to-day -day lives to be the kind of embodied greatness that Jesus is talking about. It's not reserved for the superhero. It's not reserved for the smartest. It includes all of us, no matter what our circumstances. We can all be great. I love this story by Kaim Potok. He tells of going to college. And right before he goes to college, his mother pulls him aside and says, Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but listen to your mama. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep a lot of people from dying, and you'll make a lot of money, by the way. No, mama, says Kaim. I want to I be a writer. He comes back after his first Christmas break. His mother pulls him aside and says, Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but listen to your mother. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep a lot of people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. No, Mama, I, I want to be a writer. They have the same conversation every vacation, every summer, every break. Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but be a brain surgeon. Please, you're wasting your talents. You'll keep people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. Over time, the exchanges accumulated and the pressure intensified until finally it detonated his senior year. He says, Kaim, you're wasting your life, your gifts, you're smart. Be a brain surgeon. You'll keep people from dying. You'll make a lot of money. And the explosion detonated a counter explosion. I don't want to keep people from dying, Mama. I want to show them how to live. I want to show them how to live. And if you've ever read some of Kyan Potok's books, you know that that's exactly what he did. I want to show them how to live. There's something about greatness that Jesus is talking about that has to do with how we live and showing others how we live. 
Who has shown you greatness? Do you have someone in your life that gives you a picture of the kind of greatness Jesus is talking about? One who never pushed ahead, always let other people pass, always found contentment and real joy. The kind of person who walked this earth with grace and dignity, ennobled all of those around him. Have you ever known someone like that? If that person pops up and you have access to them by a phone or email or a letter, you should tell them. I wish I would have told the person who I think of, at least one of them. I'm about six, seven years old. I'm in Sunday school in First Reformed Church in Oak Harbor, Washington. I'm occupying this little room with Luke Wiesman and Rob Harrison and Gail Barney and Wendy Rao, who I secretly had a crush on and I would try to make fun of just because I liked her and I didn't know how to negotiate those feelings as a seven-year-old. It's very awkward. (laughs) We're in there getting our Sunday school lesson, maybe a lesson just like on this one, and all of a sudden the door opens and it's him. It's the cookie man. It's Unk. Unk was one of the patriarchs of our church. Every Sunday he would have a Tupperware full of vanilla cookies. And if you were a kid in First Reformed Church in Oak Harbor, Washington, you had rights and privileges to those cookies. He would come in and he would say, would you like a cookie? And we would shout, the cookie man's here. We'd rush him and we'd get our cookie, maybe two if we were lucky. And as we'd all gather around, Unk would just burst into song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Every year of my life that I went to that church, every Sunday, Unc would give me a cookie. When I was 14, when I was a sullen 16-year-old and too cool to care, I still went to Unk and got my cookie. (laughs) When I was a college coming back from break, I I asked him politely, Unk, can I can I still get a cookie? (laughs) Of course. You can have a cookie. All the way up until the last time I saw him, which was a few years ago before he passed to glory, he'd give me a cookie. Unk was a great man, not because he accomplished great things, but because he taught me to sing that song. And he was always a model of a faithful presence. He was faithful to his wife. He was faithful to his community. He was literally a ditch digger. Never had much money, but he was the richest man in town. At his funeral, his pastor said this, the ceiling of the church sanctuary is sagging but we don't want to fix it. It's our reminder. Unk was like a pillar to this 105-year-old community. He was a pillar who held up our community of faith with his life and faith. He was a great man who will take his place. Unk was a great man because I think he took Jesus' words to heart He just wanted to be a Christian. He just wanted to love his people. And we loved him for it. And he loved us. And it ennobled us and it made us better. Jesus is calling us to be great. You. You, you, you are called to be great. Each of you are on your way someplace. 
You're going to go north or south or east or west. You're going to do amazing things. You're going to see overwhelming beauties. As you go on your way, make your desires not too weak, but make them strong. Make your desires strong to be the kind of great person Jesus is talking about. The temptation of that invitation, though, is to think that you've got to do more and be more, that you've got to pull yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. See, Jesus knows that you are not alone. Jesus knows that you are not thrown back on yourself, but he invites you into relationship with him. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, Jesus is going to put himself last so that we can be first. On the cross, Jesus becomes the servant of all the world. Jesus is going to make it possible for everyone to be great if we have the faith to believe in him. This table is a table of faith. This table is a place of communion with our great God, the God who reframes our expectations so that all who come here, all who are fed here, might come in freedom to be nurtured on their way, on their way in Jesus' name to be a great, great follower. Amen?